Welcome to the New York Business Leaders Podcast, presented by The Coil Group. We interview the most interesting and influential business leaders in New York and hear their stories of success, challenges, and lessons learned while building their businesses and personal brands. New episodes drop weekly, so please be sure to subscribe to get updates in your favorite stream. Without further delay, here's your host of the New York Business Leaders Podcast, Gordon Coyle. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Gordon Coyle. The title of this episode, Elder Law, Medicaid, and End-of-Life Planning, may sound a bit maudlin, but it's a topic we all need to address at some point, especially for those of us with older parents. So I'm glad to speak with my friend Joe Mara, who specializes in this area of the law. Joe is an attorney and principal of the Mara Law Firm located in Yonkers, New York. And just a quick disclaimer here that this conversation should not be construed as legal advice. If you've got questions regarding anything we discuss here, reach out to Joe, whose contact info will be coming up shortly. While Joe's firm handles many different areas of the law, he focuses his time and attention on elder law which is an area of the law that deals with preparing elderly persons for financial freedom and autonomy through proper planning. Joe's got an intimate knowledge of tax laws, Medicaid rules, and practical living issues, which give him a pretty unique skill set to deal with these complexities. And this is pretty complicated stuff that you just don't want to wait until you need a nursing home or nursing home care. So like many things in life, Proper advanced planning helps achieve much better outcomes. If you'd like to connect with Joe, you can visit his website, which is maralaw.com, which is M-A-R-R-A-L-A-W, or email the firm, maralaw at maralaw.com. You can also find Joe on LinkedIn, or you can even call his office, and that number is 914-964-6806. If you have an interesting story that you'd like to tell on this podcast, why not connect with me via email? My email address is gbcoil, C-O-Y-L-E, at thecoilgroup.com. Finally, if you're watching this on YouTube, give it a thumbs up or a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks, and now on to the show. Joe Mara, welcome to the New York Business Leaders Podcast. Good morning, Gordon. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Glad to have you here. Finally, I mean, we've tried to (laughs) arrange this a couple of times. I think COVID interrupted the flow Mm -hmm. and back and forth. I think we've all grown a little bit more adaptable to scheduling things in the last couple of years. Absolutely. I think COVID is, we've gotten a little weary of COVID, right? (laughs) Yeah. Mm. So Joe, I like to start these conversations uh, with the guest introducing themselves telling us what you do, what your focus is, and then we can build the conversation from there. So why don't you take a couple of minutes and do that? Okay. Well, Gordon, I have my own practice. Uh, There's myself and three other attorneys. Uh, The practice is located in Yonkers, New York. There's various practice areas that we're involved in, which I'll explain later. Um, One of the things I thought might be interesting, give you a little insight into my background, I was an accounting major undergrad, and while there, I interned for uh, Price Waterhouse and also for a small accounting firm. When I was with Price Waterhouse, they sent me out to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, because they were short on an audit. And I actually had to interview the vice president of a Fortune 500 company. And I was like, really nervous about it being a high, you know, college senior. And they're like, here's the script, just memorize it, don't read it, and get all the information. (laughs) So that was kind of cool. And while I was in law school, I actually worked for a guy, who was Joe Torrey's personal attorney at the time. So I got to spend a lot of time with Joe Torrey and other athletes, which is also uh, very interesting. Very cool. And then, it, yeah, then I, I went back to, uh, I went to the DA's office in the Bronx, was a prosecutor for a number of years. One advantage of that is I got to try my first case before I was even admitted to the bar. And I got a conviction, by the way. Um, subsequent to that, I, I went back, I went into public accounting, I went to work at Deloitte in the tax department. And started my LLM in tax, which I eventually finished. But after a couple of years of doing that and being uh, promoted to a senior, I thought I would shoot myself. I had to spend the rest of my life doing tax. So I got out of that, went back to work for the guy I worked for in law school, then opened uh, my own practice. And one of the interesting things is one of my uh, 
law school classmates was general counsel for the Archdiocese in New York. Her firm was, and it was basically her account. So when a lot of the <clears throat> malfeasance matters came up um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I basically got about 30 plus cases involving religious malfeasance. And having basically gone through Catholic school from first grade through law school, it was kind of odd. And also I had priests and other religious people sitting down across the table from me. I don't have to ask them, look, you have to assume that the plaintiff's attorney is going to know everything about you. So I need to anything in your past. And it was kind of fascinating. You get the confession from people. But on, ironically enough, many of them did not confess to the acts they were accused of, but felt as though they somehow violated their vows in other ways. And this is how God was punishing them. So they felt guilty, even though they may not have done what they did. And one case in particular, I had a, a white Irish Maris brother. And for those of you who don't know, brother's the equivalent of a, um, a nun, a male, basically version of a nun. And he was a teacher in the South Bronx with mostly minority students. He was accused of raping an 11-year-old black student of his. Uh, I, I don't think he did it. And even though it was a primarily minority jury and the victim was um, black, uh, I was able to get him acquitted. So that that was quite satisfying for me. Also nerve wracking it was like a five week trial. So uh, very interesting. And then, you know, as time went on, my, my pro process had to adapt. I wound up uh, my practice had to adapt and I wound up taking um, custody of my children at one point. So I can't really do this litigation practice as much as I uh as I had been doing it. So um, my mom actually got sick when I was in law school and she was sick for seven years before she passed away. So I said, hmm, if people are going through this. And I had to learn a lot about elder law during that time. And I said, if people are going through this, um, you know, and, and I'm going through it, the demographics are such that other people are going to be going through it. So I started developing a specialty in elder law. And right now, that's probably the elder law estate area is probably 40, 50 percent of the practice. I have other attorneys who do real estate. I have a paralegal who's 30 years doing real estate. So that's pretty much what she does. Another attorney has been with me since the mid 90s. He does all the litigation, uh, matrimonial, landlord, tenant, other areas. But, but um, you know, there's a state administration that, you know, I kind of supervise those things, but my personal practice area that I handle pretty much exclusively by myself is elder law. Okay, interesting. A lot, a lot to unpack there. Let's, let's just step back for a second, because as you were talking about defending the uh, Maris brother for allegations that he was facing, it sounded like there was a lot of psychology at play there. Absolutely. <clears throat> there absolutely was, because when you're trying a case like that, you can't just, you know, the legal standard is beyond a reasonable doubt, right? You have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, but to try to make an argument <clears throat> that the prosecution didn't prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt in such an emotionally charged case as this, I don't think would have been effective. I literally went out to prove that he was not guilty, that, which is not the norm in a criminal case. If you have that evidence, you can do it. But I went out to prove that he was not guilty. And one of the things that was interesting, one of the things he had was a diary because it was a student during the year, earlier in the year before he was accused of this, that died, young sixth grade kid that died. Mm -hmm. And he sent out a book, like just a spiral notebook, which basically had a picture of black beauty on it. And he asked all the kids to write a note about this just, you know, for themselves. And he had kept that. And he gave it to me. And this girl had written a very flower. She was a very well written girl, a flowery note to him saying how wonderful he was. And meanwhile, the prosecution's case was that she hated him. She was afraid of him. He was miserable. He was this. So that gave me a really uh, good piece of evidence. And back in those days, and even now to an extent, discovery in criminal cases is less than it is in a, in a civil case. So I didn't have to turn this over. So basically, I got up in cross-examination and started basically asking her, um, and the judge is looking at me, like, what are you doing? Because I basically, isn't it true? And I kind of went over her, her direct. And the judge looking at me like, just isn't it true? And I kind of had to revisit it. Then 
I started formulating questions based on what she wrote in the diaries. Isn't it true that you believe brother so-and-so was a wonderful human being? No, I, I never believed that. You know, isn't it true that brother so-and-so helped you do X, Y, and Z? No, that's not true at all. Then I pulled out the diary, right? <laughs> And I had it marked. And of course, the prosecutor, oh, what is this? Uh, let's approach, blah, 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 blah. So they're like flipping out because they never saw it before. And they wanted like a brief reset. I'm like, no, I'm not giving, you know, judge, please don't. There's like, no, you can't have it. If they looked at it, so I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to lay a foundation. If you can't get it admitted, if I can't get it into evidence, then it's, you know, you have to defeat that. But if I can get into evidence, you know, does this, does this look familiar to you? And she's like, well, yes, it does. Said, How does it look for me? She goes, oh, I'm not really quite sure. Is it a fact a student passed away in your class? Yes. Is it a fact that brother so-and-so passed this around the class? Yes. Is it a fact that you wrote a note in here? Yes. Then I opened it up and I you know, had the thing marked and I said, turned it to her page. And I said, is this your handwriting? And the whole courtroom I mean, the courtroom was, it was relatively small. It was in the Bronx. They had kind of shrunk down the courtroom a little bit. So it wasn't as normal, as big as their normal courtrooms. But that would be at least 30, 40 people in there besides the jury and the court people. So it was dead silence. It was like the tension you could cut with a knife. And she looked down, looked up at me, looked down again. And I said, isn't it true that this is your handwriting? Finally looked down, looked up. She goes, yes, it is. Boom. Then I had her, I put it into evidence and had her read it. So it was extremely powerful, extremely powerful. Sounds like a made for TV movie moment. You know, it's funny. I wanted to I wanted to write a book about this and my client said no. And then I also kept the transcripts for years. And then at one point I put everything in storage and totally forgot I had put the transcripts there and now they got shredded. I was like, <laughs> oh no. So if I ever want the transcripts back, I'm gonna have to go order them and God knows how much it's gonna cost me, but. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So, so let's turn our focus on to elder law. Can you give us um, the layman's description of what elder law is, how it differs from trust and estates law, and then we can kind of go from there? Okay, absolutely. It's interesting, Gordon. A lot of people call up and they go, do you do elder care? Well, I know what they're talking about, but no, I'm not going there taking care of your relative. It's not elder care. <laughs> But a lot of people, laymen, refer to elder law as elder care. All right. So now we got past that. What is elder law? Well, generally, it encompasses a few areas. Right? But the major focus is how do you protect someone's assets if it looks as though they're going to need nursing home care? Because Gordon, right now, nursing homes can cost anywhere from ten to 18000 a month. So unless you're like some people, yeah, they have assets that are generating 200000 in income, or they have assets where maybe they only have to eat into their assets to the tune of twenty or 30000 a month. So for them, it doesn't really matter. When you have people who maybe have a million, $2 million or less, and they, they're going to run through their assets pretty quick. I mean, you know, 10 months in a nursing home at at least 150000 right? 20 months, at least 300000 so there has to be a way to protect the majority of their assets. And that's a lot of what elder, elder law is. It's basically understanding the Medicaid law and the Medicaid statutes, okay, and taking steps to protect it. Now, literally, someone could come to me, mom's going in the nursing home tomorrow, what, what, what do I do? I could still help them, believe it or not. Okay. There's still something I can do, could protect some of the assets. But the best time to do it is for the person to plan five years in advance before this is an issue. Why? Because it's a five-year look-back period. So in other words, let me just tell you, basically, there's a few things you're allowed to have to qualify. And that's the goal with, of this, qualify for nursing home Medicaid. What's the goal? Get them into Medicaid, qualify for, you know, for nursing home Medicaid. Because people think, well, that's a lesser, you're not going to get the same care. Well, that's not true. If you're in a semi-private room, you're going to get the same care, whether someone next to you never earned a dime and is being paid for the state, or you're going through your, all your assets. So, you know, because you basically have the wrong disease. You have, you have basically Alzheimer's or something equivalent to it because you can't handle the daily activities of living. 
You can't feed yourself, clothe yourself, bathe yourself, medicate yourself. You can't do that anymore. And that's why you're in the nursing home, right? Ultimately. I mean, I can go into a lot of the particulars, but I won't bore you with it. But that's the goal. How do I get someone on to nursing home Medicaid and preserve their assets? So there's a five-year look back period where, so if I had, um, if you had a million dollars and you weren't married because other rules with spouses, if you had a million dollars and a million dollars over what you're permitted to have, which we won't go into that, but you are permitted to have something. But if you have a million dollars over what you're permitted to have and you give it away to your kids, assuming you're not married, you give it away to your kids or to anybody else, five years go by, it's as if you never had the assets. They don't look. Now you'll qualify for nursing home, Medicaid. All right. And so that's one of the goals we do. So in, in doing that, well, we have to prepare wills, you know, because let's say particularly spouses, one spouse is feeble, the other one isn't. We try to plan. Part of doing that is through wills. Another way of doing that is through trusts. So we do draft wills. We do do trusts. And a lot of it is geared toward that ultimate goal of getting someone on Medicaid in case they need to go in a nursing home. Now, the other thing that we do that I do that's, that deviates from that, I have an LLM in tax. And when I realized an LLM in tax, like in other words, I have a second law degree. Academically, law is messed up because when you get a law degree, you're a jurist doctorate. So you could call me Dr. Mara if you want, Gordon. But <laughs> the second degree is a master's, which is totally contrary to most academic things. But I have the second law degree in tax. So when I realized I wasn't going to stay in tax forever, I took all the courses on estate taxes and um, planning, state planning. So that kind of dovetails in with the elder law because now you know, granted for federal, you have to have over $12 million to have a federal estate tax. And um, couples together can shelter over 20, you know, married couples can shelter over $24 million relatively easily. But New York State's estate tax kicks in approximately 6 million. And it's basically called a cliff tax. You ever heard of that term? No. Okay. Well, what it means is it was first popularized around here in Connecticut. And Connecticut, I think, has since gotten rid of it, but New York decided to implement it. So basically, you have a, a low threshold of tax. But as soon as you get over 5% over the threshold, meaning 5% over 6.1 million, it's the full tax from the first dollar. Okay. And the full tax is 14%. Hmm. So 14% of, say, $6.5 million, a lot of money. So even though people think that, oh, I don't have to worry about uh, the state taxes because between me and my wife, we have less than 24 million, but maybe you have 10 million combined and now you're going to get subject to New York state estate tax unless you plan because you have to plan when both of you are still alive. I recently had an estate woman come into me and one of the reasons why she came into me is her husband died. They never had kids and they had $10 million and an attorney drafted the will didn't do any New York state estate tax planning. So now we have to try and do it. And quite frankly, it's kind of difficult to do it now. The only way you do it is by giving the money away or having charitable quests when you're a single person. But when you're married and both of you are alive, there's a lot you can do. So that's also what we do. So um, kind of looking at, <clears throat> at elder law versus trust and estates law, you're, what you're kind of painting a picture for me, at least, is, is that younger people, younger meaning, let's say, less than 65 years old, and I consider that young today, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they can do a lot in the trust and estates area. But when you're kind of like, let's say, in your 80s, and you may be facing your demise at some point in the near future, it may be too late for doing creative trust and estate work and you've got to get into elder law. Am I kind of getting that right? Kind of. I mean, simplistically, yes. I mean, it's, there's a lot of things people can do, like even in their 50s, let's say they have a, a lot of assets and um, they could do estate tax planning and elder law at the same time by basically setting up an irrev irrevocable trust that they have no control over. What benefits of that? Well, if they have to go to a nursing home, those assets can't be touched. And also, if their assets are going to appreciate, they're going to go to whoever 
they're there for. And over time, those assets can appreciate and not be subject to an estate tax. What's the downside of that? Well, now the person has no more control over the assets, which a lot of people don't like. Yeah. But yeah, you could do planning, but you have okay. to give up control to a certain so, degree. So the two types of law, trust and estates and elder law, are not necessarily mutually exclusive or separate. Not at all. They're very no. intertwined. They are intertwined. But here's the difference. A lot of people, and I've seen this too, uh, people go to a lawyer who maybe knows how to draft the will or draft the trust, and then he does something like, um, and I've seen it, he drafts a trust and he, and he drafts an irrevocable trust, but he doesn't draft it in a way that it protects the money from Medicaid. It has like back doors to go into to get the assets, which vitiate things for Medicaid. So it's like I had a nun in grammar school, I went to Catholic school, who used to say a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And I've seen some trust and estate lawyers who are very knowledgeable in trust and estate draft estate plans because they that basically have a big wide hole in them because they didn't plan for potential someone going into Medicaid and the person doesn't have enough in the way of assets to throw off enough income to pay for the nursing home. They're gonna have to dip into the assets. So, you know, and I've also seen things like which I, I consider, and I've seen it all the time. Example. Someone buys a house. Well, let me back up and tell you what I'm getting at. They do planning that might work for Medicaid planning purposes, but it's totally horrible for income tax purposes. Well, how could, you know, how does that play in? All right. Example. You buy a house for, you've been in your house 30 years, okay? And you paid 200000 for your house. Now, tax basis is generally cost plus improvements, less depreciation, and there's no depreciation on your personal residence, right? So you pay 200 grand for the house. Now you put 150 into it. So your basis is 350, but your house is worth 950 if you were to sell it, okay? Now, income tax purposes, um, if you and your wife sell your house, if you're married, each individual has $250,000 exclusion from gain for income tax purposes, okay? And you and your wife have a $500,000 exclusion. So taking my example of a 950 house with a 350 basis, right? At 600,000, you're already, boom, right off the bat, you're protecting 500,000. If you were to sell it with your wife, plus there's gonna be closing costs and other things. And if you planned in advance and you made improvements, further improvements to your house, you could eliminate any tax on most of the tax, which you'd have to pay capital gains tax on, right? So now you're in a situation where mom and dad are getting older and, oh, we wanna make sure Medicaid doesn't touch our house. So we give it to the kids. Bad idea, why? Now it's in their name. Number one, if you had senior star exemptions or anything of that nature that goes out the window for regular tax star, purposes property tax purposes because right. out the window it's no longer your principal residence you can't deduct the taxes anymore uh your real estate tax are going to go up and you're going to lose a potential deduction i mean i know we're limited to ten thousand, but now there's kind of ways to kind of get around that that's another issue but um you're limited on your deduction you can't take it anymore okay number one Number two, your kids are going to have it in their name. They can't take a star exemption on it. So prices are higher. Now, when they sell it, they take your basis, right? They now have your basis. So guess what? They got to pay tax on the full 600 grand, right? So bad idea. What would be yeah. another way to get around that? Be another way. Well, if you did it in advance, in five years in advance, you put the house in an irrevocable trust that has certain tax um, clauses in it that make it transparent for tax purposes. So what do I mean? It's an irrevocable trust, but for tax purposes, you still own it. So what does that mean? You still take the real estate tax deductions. Your taxes don't go up. When you die, there's still a step up in basis. But for Medicaid purposes, after the five years, you don't own it anymore. So you get the best of both worlds. So there are certainly ways of doing proper planning. 
So you've mentioned Medicaid and Medi Medicaid many times, and I want to kind of clarify that. Because for a lot of people that have not had this experience, especially with older parents, we may not be familiar with what these terms mean and why okay. you're focusing on Medicaid. Can you explain that? Good point. I think first I need to distinguish between Medicare and Medicaid because many people get confused, right? And rightfully so. That if you don't haven't been in the system, you don't know. What is Medicare? Well, it's insurance. We're all required to pay Medicare premiums out of our paycheck, or if you're self-employed, you got to pay them on your own. And basically, when you're 65, you're supposed to apply for it, unless there are certain exceptions, exemptions, and so on. But it's cover your insurance. And covers health insurance. And there are many gaps, as we know. But let's focus on the nursing home aspect of this, because remember what I said at the beginning, one of the purposes of elder law is to qualify someone for nursing home Medicaid. Now, people think if they go into a nursing home, they're entitled to Medicare benefits. Well, are you? I'll give you a typical lawyer answer. It depends, <laughs> right? Here's when, you're, here's when you're entitled to Medicare benefits if you go in a nursing home. Number one, you have to be transferred from the nursing home after a minimum three-day stay in a hospital. So that's requirement one, transferred from a hospital after three-day stay. Requirement number two, you have to be transferred into the nursing home or rehabilitation center for the purpose of rehabilitation. What does that mean? Classic example, someone on Medicaid, walking down the street, falls, breaks their hip. They go to the hospital, they get surgery, right? They stay in a hospital, hospital discharge them to the nursing home, they get rehabilitation. Now, if that person was otherwise physically and mentally competent before this incident, basically after the rehab in the nursing home, they would get discharged and go home. Now, what is the Medicare benefit under those circumstances? Maximum benefit now, Not every, you don't get this all the time, maximum benefit, 20 days in full. Then there's a, another 80 days where there's a copay. The copay changes every year. Right now, I think it's about $180 a day. So just as an aside, when you check your Medigap policies, if you're getting uh, a supplement to Medicare or if you're doing a Medicare HMO or PPO, Make sure that it's covering that copay. Because depending on it, the more you pay in your premiums, the more you're going to cover it. But I'm not going to go into the specifics about that because you can do an indemnity plan, which in my idea is the best plan because that covers all your copays. You're not part of an HMO. But there's Medicare HMOs where Blue Cross might say, hey, you know what? Instead of paying Medicare, pay us. You'll get more. Okay. Well, for people who can't afford it, that's a good deal. But for people who can't afford it, that might not be a good deal. So bottom line is, and remember, this Medicare benefit is a maximum of 80 days, 20 days in full, maximum of 80 days. So typically, no one's kicked out after 20 days. Right? But then it comes a point, they evaluate you and they say, okay, you are no longer benefiting from rehabilitation. Therefore, your Medicare benefits are stopping. So you could be at day 50, you're no longer benefiting at Medicare. You're no longer benefiting from rehab. So now your Medicare benefits are stopping. So now if you were, like I said, competent, mentally competent, physically okay before this happened, you just go home, right? But now let's go to another example. John is, has Alzheimer's. He is physically competent, physically competent. And he's single, let's say. And let's say he's living with his son and daughter-in-law. Now John escapes from the house, falls, breaks his hip. Does he get Medicaid? What do you think? That's a little quiz for you, Gordon, see if you're listening. You think he gets Medicaid? Medicaid or Medicare? No, no, no. Will he eventually, will, talk, will everybody gets Medicare? So that's not, if he paid insurance into the system, he gets it. Okay. But now let's fast forward a little bit. They have now told him, 
you're no longer benefiting from the rehab. However, right, right. Okay. John now has to stay because of his injuries from the fall. He can no longer attend to his daily. He never could before, but now right. his caregivers, it's going to be impossible for them Got it. to Got attend it. to his <clears throat> his benefits, all right, attend to his needs. So he's got to stay in the nursing home. So under those circumstances, is he going to get, is he going to get um, Medicaid? Well, <clears throat> well, it depends. Exactly. Very good. <laughs> Very good. So, but remember, we all get Medicare, whether you're, you know, as long as you're going in for rehab. So if you had Alzheimer's before, but you're going in for rehab, you're going to get you're going to get Medicare. So maybe to make a break, the, the Medicare port, Medicare paying for nursing home is very short term in nature and is focused solely on rehab. It's not focused on inability to take care of yourself. Precisely. Okay. Excellent. You got so it. Now I'm, we, very, I'm very proud of you. you got well, it. Well, I just <laughs> recently went through this over the last oh, yeah. several years. So, so then, <clears throat> so then, the next step is how does Medica Medicaid come into play? And that's where okay. you were going with it. But I wanted to kind of make sure we broke the two pieces apart. Right. Well, let me just explain um, this basically a single person and then there's a married couple. And there's different rules in a sense. Um, the first set of rules for a single person and they apply to a married couple, but the spouse at home, if the spouse is at home, the rules with respect layer on top of the single person. So let me explain what I mean. If someone has, there's certain exempt assets. Number one, your home up to a value of about, once again, this varies from year to year. I think it's 950,000 in equity. So if you have that, that's protected, okay? Um, your IRA or 401k and payout status, that's protected. Some personal items like a car, furniture, television, things like that, those are protected, okay? Um, you're allowed to have approximately $17,000 in addition to this, and you're allowed to prepay your funeral expenses. So pretty significant. So once again, I'll quiz you. You have a single person, they have a $800,000 home, they have a million dollar IRA that's in payout status, right? They have 17,000 in the bank and they are in, um, you know, they have prepaid their funeral. Can that person go on Medicaid if they need to? Sounds like Nursing right. on Medicaid. Yeah, they can. Okay. They can. One thing I left out from what's the other part of it is this. When you go to a nursing home, you're only allowed 50 bucks a month. That's it. What do you okay. mean 50 bucks a month? In your income. Oh, in your income. <clears throat> right. So from, let's say. Even from, any from source, qualified sources. Any source. Any so source. If you, <clears throat> if you had a million dollar IRA and your life expectancy <clears throat> was 10 years, so you just got 100,000 paid out of your IRA, that first 100,000 goes to the nursing home and then, you know, and then you had a pension, Social Security, whatever you had. That all goes to the nursing home and Medicaid picks up the rest if there is any. So that's kind of the, you know, the caveat. So it's not necessarily <clears throat> fully protected income. The income is not income is not protected hardly at all. Yeah. So the assets just are protected. Qualification standard. <clears throat> Your income is not protected. Okay. Income is not protected, but your <clears throat> your assets can be protected. And like I said, with the IRA, if it's a payout status. The RMD, required minimum distribution for that year, has to go to the nursing home, has to get paid out. Can't avoid that. <clears throat> so when people try it, people have significant income, it's very difficult to protect it. The other side of the coin, people who want to live at home, <clears throat> who have limited income, who want to get Medicaid home care, well, there's ways of protecting their income, but that's another, a whole nother thing. That's part of elder law too, but it's not something we totally focus on because, quite frankly, people <clears throat> with limited income generally can't afford to pay an attorney, right, to protect. So, but uh, there are there are agencies that help those folks protect their income. <clears throat> so um, that's what happens with a single individual qualifying for Medicaid. So once again, it's single individual 
Medic nursing home Medicaid, that's all we're talking about. There's also Medicaid home care. It's a different subject. We're leaving that out for now. Um, now, what happens, I mentioned that if there's a married person, the spouse at home, they're called in the parlance a community spouse. Well, they're allowed more. They're allowed up to $3,300 in income as opposed to $50. So if, you know, $5,350 is the combined income, of the spouses, the spouse at home keeps, you know, 3,300. The spouse in the nursing home keeps 50 bucks and 2,000 goes to the nursing home, right? The spouse at home also could prepare their funeral expense and also the house conveyed to them as an exempt asset, which you'd want to do because the house isn't only, is in the name of the person in the nursing home. New York State, when they provide Medicaid lien, could put could provide Medicaid could put a lien on the house of that person. So you want to get it transferred to an exempt person, and one exempt person is a spouse. Right? So they can't put a lien that unless the spouse goes into the nursing home. But as long as the spouse doesn't, they don't they can't assert a lien on the home. It's protected. So while I said before, for a single individual, the house is protected. The caveat is when they put a Medicaid, when they when they get Medicaid benefits, then they can assert a lien, Medicaid could assert a lien on the house. That's still a good thing because Medicaid pays 75 to 80% of all the nursing home benefits in New York state. And they don't pay the private pay rate. They usually pay about two thirds of the private pay rate. So if the nursing home is charging 15 grand to you out of your pocket, Medicaid is only paying 10 grand. So if you get Medicaid and they have to put a lien on your house after you're still saving 5,000 a month, makes sense. Mm -hmm. all right. yeah. But if the house is transferred to an exempt person, <clears throat> And spouse is an exempt person, what's called a caretaker child, meaning a child who's lived in the house with the parent was taking care of them. The caretakers defined very loosely. You could transfer it to them. But as we discovered, discussed before, that may have some tax implications, which should be considered before that's done, income tax implications. Uh, and then also what's called a sibling with an equity interest. So you got two siblings living in a two family house. One of them's good, one of them isn't. Well, maybe you might want to consider transferring it to the spouse who's in good shape. I mean, the uh, sibling is in good shape. So these are all things that have to be considered. So <clears throat> it's, it's a very complicated situation. You have to look, first of all, okay, is there an estate tax issue here? You know, is there potential New York state estate tax? That's the first thing I consider. Then is there a spouse at home? Is there a child living in the premises? Is there a sibling living in the premises? These are all things that have to be considered in deciding what the plan is. So it's not you can't you it's not a one size fits all. Every circumstance is different. Well, I think you use the word complicated, and that would be a bit of an understatement mm -hmm. <laughs> based on this mm -hmm. conversation. So, so who are your clients predominantly that are in this elder care, uh, elder law situation? Well, there are people in their 60s, 70s, and sometimes early 80s who want to do planning themselves. They're the children of these folks who now are becoming feeble, who now realize, well, mom and dad never did anything, so it's time for us to plan for them. So those are the kind of people for the elder law, you know, okay. and for the estate tax planning, people with a lot of money, obviously, who say, well, you know, I want to set things up. And state taxes might be good for people with younger children who have a lot of money because they say, well, look, I, you know, this, these assets are going to keep appreciating. I have real estate, I have stocks and bonds. And despite our recent downturn in the stock market, if you look over the last hundred years, stocks have gone up. If you just invest in a, a market mutual fund, stocks are going to go up 8% a year all the time. So I want to get some of this assets out of my name and have them set up for the benefit of the kids so I don't have to pay estate taxes on them. So those are my range of clients, people who wanted to protect themselves in case they need to go on, in case they need to go to a nursing home. Uh, children of these people and people with money who potentially have an estate tax issue who want to protect against the estate tax. And you had said a minute ago, with well, a lot of money, can we put some parameters around a lot of money? I would say because of New York State's estate tax, uh, I would say now if you have a couple with over $6 million, they should really be considering New York State estate tax. 
Plus, the current tax laws are enacted during the Trump administration. Unless there is um, more legislation down the pike, in 2025, they were set to sunset back to the way they were. <clears throat> so if they sunset, what happens then? Well, basically, back the way they were. See, New York State's estate tax is tied into the way the federal estate taxes were. So in 2025, with inflation, because New York ups it every year, depending on the cost of living, they're estimating that in 2025, both New York State and federal, unless something is done on the federal level, the estate tax is no longer going to kick in at 12 million or 13 million. It's going to kick in at about a little under 7 million. So people with those kind of assets, you really should be planning because either way, you're going to have New York State. You know, if you're going to plan on living in New York, you got to plan against that. And if, you know, and if federal doesn't do something, well, you got to plan against the federal coming back to 7 million as opposed to 12 million plus, which is what it is now. Yes, yeah, so the federal exemption will drop in 2023? 2025, unless uh, okay. there's legislation that changes it. Okay. And just as a side note, will the um, deductibility of uh, property taxes uh, sunset also in 2025? It's a good question. I'm not sure on the income tax issue. I don't believe so. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't believe so, but CPAs <laughs> would know. But they're doing something now. Um, with that, New York State set up, like originally under Trump, the IRS wouldn't allow it, but now supposedly they're winking like this, where small business people and other people can kind of reroute some of their money to get some part of a deduction they weren't able to otherwise. You're better off talking to your CPA. My CPA did it for me. I don't know what he did, but he did it. So you're better <laughs> off talking to your CPA. Got it. So, Joe, we're kind of coming to the end of like a 40 minute conversation. I, I want to you know, make sure we're respectful of everybody's time. You've really kind of gone into a lot of different issues, uh, a lot of complexity. For me, my big takeaway is, is that you don't need to have a ton of money at any age to start planning. So the younger you are, the more effective your planning can be. Middle-aged people, they may not be able to afford long-term care insurance to pay for the bills of a nursing home, but still there may be other ways to handle that. Later in life, people, you know, if, you, if you're the child of somebody that's in their 70s or 80s and you think nursing home is in the future, there's planning that has to be done. I guess the bottom line, my biggest takeaway is, is don't put your head in the sand and maybe talk to an expert like you about where you are in life, where your parents are in life, and you know, maximize the opportunities that are out there. Exactly, Gordon. There's one more thing I wanted to add that we didn't sure. discuss at all. Sure. Um, Ten years ago, if someone said to me, oh, "I have, I'm, I'm married, I have two kids, the relationship's good, I have no disabled people, I don't have a disabled spouse, I don't have disabled kids or grandkids, everything's great," I'd say, you know, just do wills, you and your wife. Um, and even within, if you had estate tax issues, we do estate tax planning inside the wills. No longer the case. Um, before COVID, things started getting very difficult. And um, since COVID, the, the surrogates courts, particularly in the five boroughs and in Westchester and some of the surrounding counties, it's just been horrendous. I'll just give you a quick story how things have changed. Before COVID, I had a situation. We used to go to the court. Literally, take my papers, go to the court, sit down with the clerk. If there was a minor error, the clerk would say, all right, just change this, boom. And literally, you'd get letters, testamentaries, what you need to administer someone's estate. You'd get them within two weeks and sometimes less. Okay. Now, I'll tell you a pre-COVID story. I had someone who lived in Suffolk County. I sent them the papers to sign. The notary did not fill in the county, that which we call an acknowledgement. You can put the state and county. The notary didn't mm -hmm. fill in the county. When he came back to my office, we missed that file the papers. Six months later, I get an email from the court. Oh, you got to have this re-signed because the acknowledgement wasn't filled in properly. So, of course, I was embarrassed because we screwed up, but it was six months. Before all of this, it would have been like sitting there with the clerk. I right, put in the county, just write it in. It would have been fine, <laughs> right? That's just before COVID. Now, after COVID, more people have died. They're backlogged. 
They fired people back in 2020. They made people go remote. Then they restored the budget. Budget. They try to hire people, but the damage is done. You got more people dying. You got all of it. It's backed up. It's forget it. To get anything done, it takes forever. So how do you get around that? Well, easy way is put somebody else's name on it. But if somebody else's name on your asset, then if they die before you, that doesn't help, right? Or if you want multiple people, just putting one person's name on it isn't going to satisfy your wishes. A way around that is do a revocable trust, which is what I, re what I rec uh, recommend to most people now. Whether they have a lot of assets, they have estate planning issues or not, get a revocable trust. Avoid the probate process because it's a nightmare right now. And the whole reason, not the whole reason, but the big reason is so that you can administer and distribute the assets within an estate in a relatively normal period of time, rather than getting hung up, going to the court and having all that probate nonsense is basically what you're saying. Correct. The only issue is setting it up up front. You, you know, granted you do this over time, you, know, you say it's cost, it costs less, but the thing is you're paying it now as opposed to the money being paid when you die. The other side of the court is to do it right when you leave the attorney's office. It's just not the attorney drafting the documents. You have to go and make sure everything's titled in the name of the trust. If you don't do that, it's a waste of money because yeah. you have to go to probate anyway. Yeah, yeah. All good points. And and I'll just comment that uh, my my dad passed away recently. And at, at his funeral, I said uh, that he did all the planning. It was all done well before his Alzheimer's really kicked in. Mm -hmm. um, and it gave us a roadmap of how things were to go, not only from a financial standpoint and a legal standpoint, but also from what he wanted, how he wanted his final days to be. You know, calling hospice for him to be taken care mm -hmm. of wasn't like a, a stressful situation for my siblings and I, because he said, this is the way I want mm -hmm. it to go. I don't want to have prolonged life on a ventilator or all these machines. So, um, you know, I just having gone through it, I would encourage people don't leave, you know, these difficult decisions to your kids, even if they're adult kids in their 50s or 60s or 70s. You know, if you pre plan this, if you pre plan the end of your life, it makes everybody's life a lot more easy. I, for Absolutely. Of and if you're someone like me, Gordon, who's on a second marriage and you have a blended family, it's even more important. I'll just tell you a quick case that I have right now. Guy and his wife get divorced. They have one child. Right. He gets he gets remarried in 2019. Right. He dies of covid in 2020. <gasps> oh, he had a college age child with his first wife. He did nothing. Bottom line is the second wife is living in the house. He had three properties overseas in a European country where he was from and nothing was done. No planning was done. And either him or and or his wife are hoarders. And now the wife is not making the mortgage payments on the principal residence and it's gone into foreclosure. So it's a disaster. I'm representing the, the daughter that was in college. And Terrible. basically his stepmother, uh, stepmother, no, her natural mother, who's the ex-wife of the team is paying my bills because it's just, she's trying to protect the daughter. Yeah. It's a total disaster. So things you don't even think about. You're relatively young. You don't know what can happen. You can be walk across the street and get killed. Yeah. So it makes sense to have a plan. Yeah. Yeah. And we could say that a million times, but I think, you know, just take one piece of the conversation that you talked about. And that is just the sheer complexity of the tax laws and the way Everything works between mm -hmm. property taxes, income taxes, estate taxes, state estate taxes. Like it's just like mm -hmm. simplify your life by making it a little bit more complex for a couple of weeks out of your entire life to do the planning the right way and then review that plan. How often review it, would you say? I would say at least every five years. Okay. And if you just, you know, if you're paying half attention, if you hear a new tax legislation came out or because every year too the budget in new york state gets reenacted and they're always trying to change medicaid law and mm -hmm. i'll just tell you one thing they did very quickly there was never a look back period for medicaid home care so if you need it which that's a whole other story but if you needed medicaid home care and you wanted to try to tap into it and you had some assets you could transfer them today and apply tomorrow well just before covid that was changed 
they were enacting a two and a half year look back period set to enact, be enacted. But then COVID came and the Fed said, if you New York State, if you do that, we're not going to give you these COVID benefits. So <laughs> New York State postponed the enactment of this two and a half year period. And the last I heard, last I checked was back in May. And they're supposedly going to enact it toward the end of this year. So it's like, how do you plan for that? Yeah. It's like, how, you don't even know, like, what the hell's going on? Yeah. Then first they're going to enact it. Then, then the state agency's Department of Health has to enact regulation. It's just a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. So we wow. as attorneys don't know what's going on and don't know what to do. How's someone else going to know? <laughs> you know, it's it's crazy. But, yeah. You know, it, it's just it's just insane. It is. So, yeah. Joe, if if anybody listening or watching it, watching the podcast wanted to get in touch with you, how's the best way to do that? Well, there are a number of ways, Gordon. I'm I'm active on the web, so. My my website's very easy to find, Mara Law with two R's, M-A-R-R-A, Mara Law, www.maralaw.com. Then the email is very easy if you remember the website, because the email is just Mara Law at maralaw.com. That's the firm email. Uh, on LinkedIn, you know, we have a Facebook page for the office. So easily connect with me there. Great. And uh, by phone, 914. 914- 964 6806 So it's pretty easy to get a hold of me. That's great. I will take all of those contact points and put them in the show notes in the description on YouTube. So if somebody's driving or on the treadmill, they'll have access to that information. And uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that if you have an interesting story that you'd like to tell on this podcast, Get in touch with me. I'll put my email in the show notes as well so you can reach out to me and we'll have a conversation and get you on the show. And to wrap things up, Joe, I really appreciate the time and the information you gave us today. It was a great conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Gordon. Thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Good to see you. Same here. Take care. Bye-bye. That's it for this week's episode of the New York Business Leaders Podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode. In the meantime, find more interviews and resources at nybusinessleaders.com.